I will try to amuse you about um, with a little uh, talk about counterintelligence. Counterintelligence is strategic communications. The topic really is uh, uh, Russia's tradition of deception and denial, but in a new form, mostly in an electronic form. One must remember that virtually all Russian state operations are counterintelligence operations, including strategic messaging and communications. Now, counterintelligence traditionally means uh, ferreting out spies. However, in the Moscovite context, it means neutralizing all opposition. That's why we say that Russia is a counterintelligence state, because the Kremlin wants to maintain itself in power. All operations are counterintelligence operations by the state, or related to counterintelligence. It has been like this through history. When we say Russia, we have to keep certain things in mind. First of all, Eastern Slavdom, Eastern Slavs, we have to remember Rus, Kievian Rus, then Moscovy, Russian Empire, USSR, and Russian Federation. That doesn't mean I draw a straight, straight line between Kievian Rus and uh, Moscovy. What I mean is it's one of the ingredients there. So what we have in Russia today is Eastern Slavic characteristics, Viking legal arrangement, which introduced a chasm between the indigenous and the foreigners who ruled Kiev, Byzantine orthodoxy with its Caesar or papism when there is no division between church and state and the Caesar dictates what the Pope does or the patriarch. There are also Mongol ways which the Moscovites acquired from the steppes. Then you have Tsarism that was a fusion of all those elements Communism, which is an attempted modernization of Russia uh, by introducing the most fanatical and nefarious radical Western ways to do so. And finally, we have communism transformed all or post-communism. When we talk about Russia's uh, strategic communications, we uh, really should be looking at continuities and discontinuities. The nature of Russia's strategic communications is integrated and complementary. There is a general strategy. Uh, almost invariably, all tools of power are deployed, including propaganda, and the Kremlin coordinates every single bit and piece. The target of strategic messaging is domestic and foreign markets. There are, of course, certain overlaps between domestic and foreign and certain differentiations. Usually one enforces another. The reason for any campaign by Moscow is, of course, to maintain itself in power at home. Uh, so its activities, in a way, outside are subservient to what's going on inside. A the ideas, well, vary from dogmatic to pragmatic. And it's been like this throughout history. For instance, when Ivan the Terrible was hard pressed by the armies of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, he started romancing a naive Jesuit, Antonio Posevino. And he dangled between Rome the prospect of conversion of Holy Rus to Roman Catholicism. So just the, the Polish armies under Istvan Batory would stop. And they did, because the Pope began to interfere. Oh yes, they want to be Catholic. They want to be Western Christians. There was a typical strategy mes strategic messaging operation. Of course, a deception operation, too. Uh, in more recent times, in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, one of the, one of the most successful uh, operations which infused pragmatism into dogmatism was Uncle Joe. Now, I'm not a mass murderer. I'm Uncle Joe. He duped FDR. 
who was a complete Nikon Pope, but yes, sure. But he, Stalin duped the President of the United States. Churchill knew what was uh, uh, going on, but Uncle Joe was able to manipulate and control the President of the United States to a large extent. Against Hitler, uh, truly to benefit himself and the Soviet Union. There are a number of persistent themes, historically, there have been a number of persistent themes in Russia's strategic messaging. First of all, Russia is always right. By extension, Moscow's main enemy, the United States, is always wrong unless it does what the Kremlin says. That's just the rule. There are a number of themes, propaganda themes, that reoccur constantly from the caves. First of all, all is Russia, all the Russias. Hence Siberia is Russia, Ukraine is Russia, near abroad is Russia, Estonia is everything is Russia. That's a theme. Second one, Russia is peace. That means all Russia does is to expedite peace. This is called the peace offensive. Uh, Lenin was an expert at it, and he really framed the discourse here. Another theme, another topic that you should be familiar with is that Russia is always invaded. And then you look at history and say, ah, over hundreds of years, how many times? Three? Really? And how many aggressive wars have, has Moscow fought? Hundreds? But nobody knows about it. Everybody thinks, well, poor victims in the Kremlin. Uh, Russia is surrounded by enemies, hence all its moves are defensive in nature, including the invasion of Georgia, which initially um, it was depicted as the Georgian invasion of Russia, until Putin changed his mind a year later and made a joke, haha, we duped them, we provoked them to do this. But had Putin not spoken, any allegation about Russia's aggression against Georgia would be treated as fanaticism. Russia is special. So Russia is third Rome. It's holy Russia. Russia of Slavophilism, Pan-Slavism, <coughs> Communism, and now Russia is special because Russia is sovereign democracy. It's not like parliamentary democracy. Putin said it's sovereign democracy. Yes. So it's special. Short bus special. Russia is different and needs order, otherwise anarchy break, breaks out again. Again, that's sovereign democracy. Western norms do not apply to Moscow. That's why Russia is different. It's a circular argument, but doesn't bother anybody, or hardly anybody. Russia is the guardian of civilization. Orthodoxy, Christianity, those are all hallmarks of Russia. Now Russia is the alternative. It is decent civilization. It is, a, it is the last rampart against San Francisco. Yes, Moscow will save us. Thus, Russia has become a beacon of hope and decency to many right-wingers, nationalist radicals, and even some conservatives, from Pat Buchanan to Marine Le Pen. Incidentally, this narrative assists in Moscow's influence operations, for instance, funding of Europe's political parties, populist and right-wing oftentimes, but also a very extreme left-wing. Another recurring theme is that Russia is the pivot of stability. This is a geopolitical mantra you hear. Russia is the pivot of stability. And everyone invokes Mackinder and his theory of the heartland. If you do not, I kid you not, if you do not control the geographic pivot of history, which is in western Kazakhstan now, is southern Russia and eastern Ukraine, which, of course, everybody refers to as Russia. If you do not control the geographic pivot of history, there is chaos. 
and yellow peril pours into Europe. That's my kinder, direct quote. Do you know that this survived in George Bush the first a National Security Council, and that was the reason why the United States government attempted to save the Soviet Union? So Russia is the pivot of stability. There are also some positive themes, for instance, we beat, we beat Hitler, we fly the Sputnik, and we excel at ballet. That's about it, as far as positive <laughs> themes are concerned. Uh, and of course, Russia always fights fascism, which means today in Ukraine, fascism. Let's look at some synchronized themes and techniques. First, manipulation, then reciprocity, analogy, provocation, sing signals. All of those may or may not overlap. <coughs> Often they are case studies and predictability. If you know how to read, read the Moscovite propaganda, you'll just chuckle. But most of the time, our experts don't read Moscovite propaganda and take it at face value. So provocation. This is to create havoc. Undermine the enemy's will to resist, make the opponent twitch, or just denote Moscow's ability to wreak mischief. Signals can be a, prov a provocation as evidence for, for example, the uh, Colombian chemicals disaster scare in Centerville, St. Mary's Parish, Louisiana. Have you heard about it? What happened was a social media suddenly went aflame with stories of an imminent chemical disaster in the United States. Or sometimes the disaster that must have just happened, but the media missed it. Someone created a false buzz to, to, to usher in insecurity. This is uh, the Colombian chemicals disaster scare. Nothing ever happened, but there was real panic. Ebola panic on social media, about to hit the United States. Never mind, we weren't doing enough. There were hardly any precautions in the United States, but friends flooded our social media with messages that Ebola was spreading in the United States and the United States government was covering it up. Uh, One of the most insidious recent examples of, of this kind of provocation to create havoc was Ferguson galore all over the nation, fed by rumors that yet another unarmed black woman was killed somewhere. By the police, of course, American police. And we were able to trace the friendlies back to not the grassroots <laughs> here in the United States. Uh, we were able to trace them back to the people called the Black Lives Don't Matter, uh, but abroad. The message is simple. You're never secure. The United States government fails you most of the time. And so do other Western governments. Hence, fake Russian news about the migrant crisis in Germany in particular, as far as an epidemic of rapes in Hanover and elsewhere is concerned with some at least invented by Moscow. The most notorious was the fake abduction and rape of a 13-year-old Russian girl. It was all over the media, especially the Russian media. This kind of provocation feeds on pre-existing fears and the dastardly tendency of mainstream Western media to avoid covering controversial issues regarding mi migrants or anything else. Another uh, technique is denial. It is practiced to deflect any accusations from the Kremlin. For example, Katyn, the massacre of Polish officers, never happened. Polish officers fled to Manchuria. The Germans did it. Holodomor, terror famine in Ukraine. That never happened either. Or an alternative version is, well, maybe there was famine, but everyone died in the USSR, not just in Ukraine, so no genocide. Georgia invaded Ossetia. 
or did Russia invade Georgia? The Crimea self-liberated and the little green men were in the forefront of the self-liberation. That's Russia invades Crimea. Denial can be coordinated with, with reciprocity. For instance, there was the White House a few months ago back, the White House, the Kremlin Twitter war over who really bombed Aleppo. Well, it was the Russians because our precision guided munition, here's an explanation. If you see a truck of ISIS, it gets hit, hit by an American missile, that costs $250,000. When it, everything around the truck gets hit by cluster bombs, that's 500 bucks. Because the Russians don't have guided munitions, they wouldn't waste the money. Anyway, so there was a Twitter war where we dignified their lies with reciprocity and uh, we didn't know how to handle this stuff. Talking about reciprocity. It is used to show that even though Russia perhaps does some questionable things, but that is usually because others, uh, others are even worse. Sometimes reciprocity can invoke an analogy. For instance, cutting was merely a revenge for the Bolshevik POWs that the Poles allegedly killed. No, that was actually called the influenza and the guards died too, because 19 million people perished following World War I because there was an epidemic of influenza. However, in 1988, when Gorbachev, in the negotiations with the Pope, attempted to handle the cutting case, when debating the issue with the Politburo and his propaganda experts, Gorbachev and his friends came up with an engine, with, with a, with a with an escape clause. If anything should go wrong, let's bring up the Bolshevik POWs. And we'll say that the Poles killed them in 1920. And it's still around. Gorbachev is the, is the author of this trick. It's still around. It's, it, it still lingers, this. The Gulag, ladies and gentlemen, the Gulag is better than the U.S. prison system. There are more prisoners in the, in the American prison system, and it's much worse. With all that rape. Remember, this is called reciprocity. Repression of dissident Rafusanigs for political reasons is not as bad as racism, like in the United States. So this is a, there is another refrain, reciprocity, another refrain of Soviet propaganda. You beat up black people. So how can you tell us that we do something to dissidents? Uh, and here is my favorite from probably last month, a poster in Moscow, I've observed. Cigarettes mo kill more people than even Obama. <laughs> yes. A poster in Moscow putatively advertising health, but in fact purveying a not so subliminal yet didactical message which feeds off uh, of anti-US propaganda. Russia may be killing people in Ukraine and Syria, but America kills more. Obama in particular. Yes. Still, let's keep it all in proportion. It is not such a big deal because cigarettes kill more people even than the Americans do. Okay? So this is <coughs> propaganda in a nutshell. Another technique is analogy. It is unveiled to invoke a familiar phenomenon, usually with negative uh, attributions to disparage, denounce, and delegitimize an issue opposed by the Kremlin. One of the most popular in 1980 and 1981 was that solidarity was Khomeini. Yeah, if solidarity won, we would have second Iran in Poland. Uh, Poland, the second Iran. There will be Iranization of Poland and no democracy if solidarity wins because the Poles are Catholic fanatics just like the Shia. It is best if the communists remain in power. Yes, this, is, this was a message which Western liberals and other gullible people gobbled up in 1980-81. More recently, Poland, ladies and gentlemen, 
is just like ISIS, because the Poles demand the, revo the removal of Soviet triumphalist monuments from Polish cities. Not cemeteries, no, no. There are monuments to Stalinist troops. And the Poles say, well, you know, 25 years uh, of neglect, they should go. They should be removed. Oh no, that's ISIS, like ISIS in Palmyra. I'm quoting here directly the spokeswoman of foreign ministry. The Poles are just like ISIS. That's called an analogy. You should be able to recognize this. And ISIS likewise destroys cemeteries. That's what the Russian foreign ministry said. Uh, there are also funny analogies. For instance, suddenly Russian media was abuzz with a Russian Oscar for Leonardo DiCaprio, a place in Siberia decided he deserved an Oscar before the Oscars. So nobody knew whether he would get an Oscar for his new movie. And the Russians said, here's an Oscar. Since America doesn't appreciate Leonardo DiCaprio, we appreciate Leonardo DiCaprio. Here's an Oscar. So this is propaganda through analogy. You're always involved when you do social commentary and cultural commentary constantly being in your face. This is a hallmark of totalitarianism. They will never let you sleep. They will never let you alone. They will always have a commentary on something. So let's look at ideologies, institutions, and tools. In other words, organization of this uh, counterintelligence operation. In uh, Tsarist Russia, there was something called or state school of history, and there was state ideology, which tutored um, autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationality. Then you had the institutions like the Holy Synod, Ochrana, and Russia's diplomacy that purveyed uh, the ideology and translated it into practice. The influence operations were, as always, co-opting the elite by feeding into pre-existing prejudices and thought patterns, bribing the press and officials, infiltrating emigre groups and provocations, both at home and abroad. This is from time immemorial. In Bolshevik Russia, we had an ideology of Marxism-Leninism. We had the Comintern Information Bureau, which was later, later folded into the Foreign Department of the Central Committee, we had the Common Form, and of course the Cheka and the KGB. The influence operations were fantastically professional. One of the best people was Willy Munzemacher and his stable of agents of influence and useful idiots, mostly useful idiots. But they were completely brazen. For instance, during the Civil War in Spain, a Comintern operative didn't bother to make it to Guarenica, and he described how Guarenica was born, uh, bombed by the Germans, pretending to have had been on the spot. I'm not saying that the bombing of Guarenica didn't happen. What I'm saying instead is that the Kremlin influenced the message from the very beginning through agents of influence. In the Russian Federation, the ideology is post-communism. Post-communism is... Communism transformed, communism with, okay, well, wait, go ahead. <laughs> well, if you want to uh, romance Dr. Summer, ask him out. <laughs> but, <laughs> May I? Thank you. So, uh, post-communism is uh, communism transformed, stripped of its Marxist-Leninist ideology, but not Marxist-Leninist dialectics and the methods of wielding power and control. That's what post-communism is. But post-communism now is infused with a variety of new themes, including neo-imperialism, neo-Eurasianism, and uh, uh, such. We don't know what the equivalent of the Comintern Information Bureau is today. 
I suspect, and I've made up a word, stratkom stavka, which means strategic communication center, is at the Kremlin. Ultimately, of course, Putin calls the shots, but I'm talking about a structure. U.S. or Western intelligence has not been able to identify the entity, institutionally speaking, what it is. But there is one. It's a hidden Kremlin center of strategic communications, I suppose. By deduction, there must be one. Russia stands on centralization, so there must be one. Ultimately, Putin calls the shots, but there must be a bureaucratic centralized entity that coordinates strategic messaging. There are sub-centers coordinated to it. One is at the Ministry of Defense, another one at the GRU, Military Intelligence. There is cyber training takes place at the Department of Military Information and Foreign Languages of the Military Institute of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. And also there is something called, it's a mysterious institute for information wars, which is also most likely <coughs> GRU, military intelligence. Um, there is a sub-center of strategic communications at the Federal Information and Communications Agency, FAPC, a very important institution. There is a sub-center at the FSB, Civilian Intelligence, with the Academy of Cryptography, Communications and Information uh, Science of the FSB as its feeder school. Various other strategic communications training institutions or outfits with strategic communications instructions components include most prominently the Institute for the Question of Information Security at the Lomonosov University of Moscow. Its leading lights are former FAPSI director Vladislav Sherstyuk and Professor A.P. Kovalenko of the FSB Cryptographic Academy. The Federal Service Protection Academy in Orel the State Scientific Research Institute for the Question of Technical Protection of Information with the Federal Service of Technical Control and Experts, the Voronezh Institute for Government Communications with branches in Rostov-on-the-Don, and elsewhere. Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has two sub-centers. This was just military intelligence and uh, civilian intelligence. The, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has two sub-centers, one for the near abroad and one for the rest of the world. Its feeder schools include the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGIMO, the, Diplom the Diplomatic Ac uh, Academy of the Russian Federation. Operational sub-centers <laughs> exist, and we do not know the exact relationship to the previously mentioned institutions, but they exist and we have been able to detect them. There is a troll army sub-center called the Internet Research Agency, IRA. I'll give you, Dr. Liberchuk probably will be able to detect. This is 55 Savushkina Street. They used to hide elsewhere in Olgino, in St. Petersburg, but hey, they are at 55 Savushkina Street. Uh, but that may be just the tip of an iceberg of the huge cyber dimension of strategic communications, analyzing the traffic, trying to control it, and trying to influence it. Some accounts claim that the uh, uh, inter Internet Research Agency um, relocated from Olgino to Savushkina Street. Others say no. Or maybe Olgino is a decoy passing as a main hub for there. Are, there, are, there are to be other sub-centers in, um, in uh, obscure suburbs of St. Petersburg and Moscow. We haven't yet set things up. I'm sure, or I'm not so sure, but I hope that our agencies compliments of the taxpayers' largest are working on it much more intensively than we do, who are not funded by the taxpayer. Still, it does appear that most internet traffic originates from uh, Savushkina Street in St. Petersburg. So maybe this is the hub. Or at least this, this is where most disinformation and most information uh, is openly stems for. They don't hide that location that well. Not that they advertise it, but they don't hide it that well. The IRA is tasked with fronting for most of the uh, detectable internet operations. 
In 2015, a researcher, Lawrence Alexander, disclosed a network of propaganda websites sharing the same Google Analytics identifier and domain registration details allegedly run by Nikita Podgorny from Internet Research Agency. The websites are mostly MIME repositories focused on attacking Ukraine, Euromaidan, Russian opposition and Western policies. Other websites from this cluster promoted President Putin, Russian nationalism, and one was spreading alleged news from Syria presenting uh, uh, anti-Western point of view. In August 2015, Russian researchers have correlated Google's search presence of specific phrases with their geographic origin, observing a phenomenon of significantly increased number of specific politically eroded phrases such as Poroshenko, Maidan, Sanction, starting from 2013 and originating from very small peripheral, peripheral location in Russia, namely Olgina. Incidentally, as far as integrated strategy, the IRA was a, uh, was a sponsor of Vyeshdoki, so-called documentary exhibit about how evil the US has been in the international arena. We can draw a few conclusions from internet research, from the Internet Research Center phenomenon. It appears that at home, the post-Soviets farm out certain strategic messaging tasks to outside contractors, the over-educated and the underemployed, or ideological warriors, such as the Nashi Proclam Kremlin Youth Group, and the secret police monitors the process rather than runs it directly. This means that uh, Moscow has copied the Comintern modus operandi from abroad to Russia. You have agents of influence and you have useful idiots who repeat endlessly strategic messages. Why? It's cheaper. It's at home. With social media, you don't need to travel anywhere. You don't need to have people at Times Magazine. You just have to inform Times Magazine or the Time of London. And abroad, it looks like Russia's propaganda employs often its own nationals, both emigre and visitors. For example, in Germany, the alleged Hanoverian rape victim, Victoria Schmidt, turned out to be Natalia, who headed the freelance Russian camera crew, herself and the cameraman Oleg Cherkasov, uh, which carried out propaganda stunts for the Kremlin taskmasters. But they were supposed to be rape victims. And at any event, it appears that there is a rather small number of operatives at work. For instance, the Columbia chemical catastrophe, Ebola scare, and racial murder hoax appear to be narrated on YouTube by the same individual speaking Australian English with a forced pseudo-American accent. It's on, on uh, YouTube. Just look it up. Influence operations. Uh, which continue concern intelligence outfits such as Russia today, intelligence, counterintelligence, and strategic messaging outfits, Russia today, Sputnik, and agents of influence, mercenaries, and useful idiots, and mavericks. During the invasion of Georgia. Look it up. Uh, an editorial appeared in the Wall Street Journal by a very prominent, extremely rich person. And this was the, the, probably the only time this person surfaced publicly, which argued that Russia was the victim and Russia was helping. Russia was not at fault. This is an oil man, an American. Long-time resident of Russia. So, because of the nature of today's media and our world, one doesn't need to relocate. One deploys whatever tool, tools one has at home. And that's what Russia does. It does with Russia today. And Sputnik. And is always, in Russian tradition, 
whatever operations occur abroad have an intelligence angle to them. So they are not just influence outfits of, of Russia today, they're also intelligence outfits or counterintelligence outfits. In, in addition to occasional billionaire who'll step up and does what is requested of him, the agents of the Kremlin fund a number of institutions in the West. There is something called in France the Institut de la Démocratie et de la, de la Coopération, the Institute of Democracy and Cooperation, it was founded in 2008 during the Georgia crisis. And it advocates, it still advocates, for instance, an international system that respects the sovereignty of states and nations and a political order grounded on the Judeo-Christian ethic of both parts of Europe in France. Except it says that Russia never invaded Georgia, or it did at that time. Except it courts, the ADC courts radical uh, right, populists, and traditional, uh, traditionalist Catholics in France who have nowhere to go. They have a venue. They now have a venue and a platform. Compliments of the Kremlin. There are some mavericks. For instance, Pat Buchanan, or our friend Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, former head of DIA, who now consults for Russia today. He's been to Moscow. He thinks the Russians are effective in Syria. Obama failed completely, so he, for pragmatic reasons, works on uh, uh, some kind of Russian-American rapprochement. Flynn sees Putin as an ally against the caliphatists. Buchanan, for Buchanan, uh, the Kremlin is an ideological ally to counterbalance the West's countercultural revolution. Moscow treats both of them as useful idiots or and agents of influence. They are in fact victims of active measures and of, of political miscalculation. The question is whether they can limit the damage to themselves and their country. Uh, of course there are useful idiots too. For instance, MSNBC's Ed Schultz has just gotten employed with Russia today. Oh yeah. There is, in, in, in France there was something called ProRussia.tv which operated for two years. It was run by a, uh, by a National Front politician, so Marine Le Pen's friend, Gilles Arnaud, who also may be a maverick or and mercenary, as he benefited handsomely from the venture. The categories can overlap. You can be a useful idiot and still paid a lot of money for it. There are mercenaries, however. J. Michael Waller wrote about the laid-off Pentagon contractors <coughs> who now work for the Kremlin, specifically Russia Today. For instance, U.S. citizen Zlatko Kovac, who has the Russia Today DC office. He moved from the U.S. Special Operations Command's Trans-Regional Web Initiative. That's what happens when we have highly trained people and we fire them or lay them off. They have nowhere to go. Okay, so for conclusion, efficiency and success. Russian foreign propaganda is hardly for the people. It targets the elite. Opinion polls in the Western world consistently show that the public holds a negative view of Russia, despite all this propaganda. In the US, it hovers around 65%. The levels of negative perceptions are similar in the UK, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Uh, they are usually around 60%. France polls at 70% negative perception. The, high of, the highest NATO negative mark for Russia registers in Poland, 80%. So there is no success of the Kremlin at this level, at the popular level. But it would be misleading to posit that Russia's propaganda works the same way that strategic messaging in democratic countries or that the Kremlin's strategic aim is to influence the public. 
It may not always sway the masses, but the Russian narrative gives sustenance to dissident elements in targeted countries, sometimes even permeating mainstream narratives. Look at the enduring strength of Stalin's narrative of the Second World War. We liberated! No, we enslaved. We kicked the Nazis out and then we enslaved. So we didn't liberate anybody. Look at political correctness pervading the United States that is reinforced by the Kremlin's message day in and day out. Look at Howard's Zins, a people's history of the United States, which dominates at high schools and colleges and which might as well have been written in the Kremlin in the 1920s. Look at the horrible image of America abroad, in the developing world in particular, when the rec a recent poll has just shown one-third of Iraqis fully convinced that the United States is behind all terrorist attacks on their country. Including when uh, a suicide bomber blew up a, a, a soccer team of 12-year-olds in a village. 25 kids died. That's America's fault. Remember in the 1960s, America with three Ks, as in the Ku Klux Klan? Well, the Kremlin feeds on it. So, should we have no worries? No. Russian influence perversely implants nefarious thought patterns and reinforces malicious narratives. And it promotes individuals and groups like in Poland, ex Samobrona and now Zmiana party Piskorski, who would otherwise have no access to mainstream, but now they have found a handy platform to project themselves via the Russian media and they show to the world that what we cherish, freedom, is evil. And the best alternative is what the Kremlin has to offer. Thank you very much.